the F-14D was the ultimate version of the Tomcat to reach service. Our guest, experienced F-14D pilot and former Top Gun instructor Jungle Jones, talks about what it was like to take the Super Tomcat into training dogfights against F-15s, F-16s, and F-18s, and into combat. He goes into detail on why it was the greatest Tomcat we ever saw. Don't miss this one. Hi, everybody. My name's Craig Snyder, call sign Crunch, and I used to be an F-14 Tomcat pilot, a Top Gun instructor, and I'm one of your hosts here on the F-14 Tomcast. And I'm Dave Baranek, call sign Bio, former F-14 Rio and Top Gun instructor, and I'm your co-host for the F-14 Tomcast. You know, when the F-14D was introduced, it represented what the Tomcat should have been for most of its service life. An improved radar, glass cockpit, Numerous state-of-the-art systems and, oh yeah, those fantastic F-110 engines. In the end, only 55 F-14Ds were created, representing less than 10% of total F-14 production. But as the last American Tomcats flying, they left a strong impression. And today, our guest is retired Commander Robert Jungle Jones, who used to be an F-14 pilot and Top Gun instructor pilot as well. And he is here to talk to his, talk to us about his insights into what really is one of the mightiest of the F-14s, the F-14D. Jungle, welcome. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Hey, welcome Thank to the podcast, Jungle. Fantastic, man. Great to be with you. Great to see you again, Crunch. Great to see you again, Bio. Last time I saw you was uh, at the table at the 50th anniversary of Top Gun. Jungle, that was a great event. I, that's where we met. And, uh, you know, that was, that was a good memory. I'm glad we were all able to make that. Absolutely. Hey, hey, to kick us off, I'll go ahead and uh, ask the first question. Jungle, tell us uh, where you're from, how you got commissioned, and uh, how you got into naval aviation. Well, uh, Bio, I was um, a Villanova guy, Villanova Navy ROTC. Uh, I'm, I was born in Florida. Uh, my entire extended of family is in Florida. Uh, but I, um, uh, and I'm living in Florida now, uh, but I say I'm from Philadelphia. I, I spent from 10 years old through college graduation uh, there in Philadelphia area. So I'm a long suffering Eagles fan and, and a Flyers fan and everything. So, uh, so that's where I say I'm from. Um, my family, you know, has a, a, a rich military background. Um, not a lot of aviators. My father was an astronautical engineer and aviator, uh, a civilian. But I was around aviation from, actually, there's pictures of my mother pregnant with me uh, as they're building airplanes, you know, from the Experimental Aircraft Association. So I was around it my whole life. Um, knew I wanted to be a fighter pilot as a young man, very young man, um, which I thought just meant I was going to be an Air Force pilot. And then I was at uh, Oshkosh, the big air show, uh, summer of 78 with my dad. And that was back when you'd stand a whole lot closer to the uh, to the flight line and I was right on the show center and there was a Tomcat demo going on and I was back with the high gloss white paint jobs and the full squadron colors and, and then F-14 did this demo and, and disappeared and the, and the announcer said something about it going back to the ship and everybody got a chuckle and they started uh, introducing the next pilot, uh, aerobatic pilot, Dwayne Cole, who I'll never forget, a world-class aerobatic instructor. And right in the middle of Dwayne Cole's, the world famous, and from the left, the high speed pass. And everybody looks to the left, and silently down the runway comes a transonic uh, super ton or a F 14A, uh, perfectly quiet, perfectly blue sky, sun glinting off the canopy, thumped my 11 year old chest and exited in vertical rolling. I'm talking to my dad going, what was that? I want to do that. And, and so I knew from uh, from 11 that I wanted to be an F-14 pilot out of Miramar. You know, and, and once armed with that information, I was ahead of most people who didn't really figure out what they wanted to do in life until much later. Uh, so that's what I did. Cool. That is amazing. So so you get commissioned and uh, you're in flight school. How did you end up uh, in F-14s? Top of your class or lucky a week yeah, or what? Yeah, it was... Uh, <laughs> Um, right when we were going through, uh, you know, we had the, uh, 
what do they call it during the Bush administration? The uh, um, when the the Soviets had their going out of business sale. Um, oh yeah, oh, and shit. We, the the wall came down. Yeah, Whatever. and it was a wonderful time, very exciting time. But uh, the uh, peace dividend is what they were calling it, the peace dividend. And we we cut all the budgets right when I was getting started in flight school, and uh, it was a very competitive time. And I, uh, man, you know, it was really something. But I, I did very well. Um, I uh, I'd learned just enough about how to fly. Uh, um, I could ba basically take off and land, but was not a private pilot at all. But you know, had been around airplanes my whole life, and and then helped a lot and um, and worked my butt off. And I was I was number one in fiscal year uh, eighty nine. I was uh, uh, did uh, number one out of T thirty four Charlies, and then number one out of uh, Beeville, Texas. And number one Sinatra wide for for fiscal year eighty nine and and so then uh, got my choice uh, which was amongst um, six S three slots and a Prowler was what I was offered and uh, I was, I was <laughs> bad timing yeah absolutely heartbroken uh, you know no offense intended but I, I I definitely wanted to be a Tomcat pilot at Miramar and my uh, my skipper, a guy by the name of Jet Palmetier, was so incensed by that that uh, he went to bat for me and said, I'll, I'll keep you on as a surgrad, which was a program where they would keep a, a freshly winged aviator on as an instructor. I'll keep you on as a surgrad. We'll get you up into Tomcats next year. I was like, all right, sir, whatever you think is best. He called me up later that night. He said, Jungle, I, I'm really sorry, man. I uh, I couldn't make you a surgrad. And, that's why I really appreciate it, sir. I, I know you did your best. It was a real honor just for you to even try. He said, yeah, the best I could do was Super Tom Cats out of Miramar. And uh, I was student number one into class number one of F-14 Ds. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> That's awesome. Congratulations. That, that's, that's pretty cool. I mean, I got, I got, I'm just thinking back over there. I swear to God, like your little story about a little story, your story about being an 11 year old, getting a, getting thumped, you know, it, it, all the way to that kind of turn, you know, uh, fortune. I mean, I get a little chills from it. That's awesome. It's so exciting. Oh, I, I, I couldn't believe it. I, I, I literally couldn't believe it. I, I called Jet's house later that night, about 1130, after celebrating, you know, all day with my friends there in Beeville, I, I started getting paranoid. Did I really hear what he said? And I called about 1130 at night and I got, got Mrs. Palmatier and said, you know, ma'am, uh, I'm terribly sorry. But, uh, and she just started laughing at me and said, yes, it's real. It's true. You're going to get a nail. Yeah. That's awesome. You know, yeah. I asked uh, guys that I used to fly with, you know, how did they get started? And a lot of guys, same thing, air shows. So if people ever wonder if air shows are worth it, yeah, that's where a lot of aviators uh, gain their inspiration. I, I spent as much free time as I could at every chance I had in all my career. I tried to get back to air shows for exactly that reason. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Very so now, good. once you got to the rag, so jungle, you you uh, you, you got to the rag. You're you're, you're flying the F-14Ds. Uh, what was your career path after that? What squadrons were you in? So uh, obviously, a gunfighter 124 there at the rag, um, and um, then the first F-14D squadrons were sister squadrons VF-31, VF-11. I was with 31. Um, and uh, was there at Miramar. That was my only Miramar tour. We, uh, we consolidated and moved all the Tomcats shortly thereafter uh, out to the East Coast. Um, and then I, when I went out to the East Coast, I did my Super J.O. tour with 213 with the Black Lions, who had just transitioned in D's. Um, and so I, I brought in to kind of help with that transition. And then, um, and then I, did my, I did two more uh, deployments with VF-31 again, uh, still in D's, uh, just across the flight line. Uh, all of my deployments were West Coast. I never, uh, never did a med deployment, but uh, I did four, uh, four deployments: um, 31, 213, 31, 31 um, uh, in the Tomcat. Nice, nice. How many, how many traps you get at doing all that? Four deployments. Uh, overall, I, I did five deployments overall. Last one was in Super Hornets. Um, I got, I ended up, I think I'm the high time F-14D pilot, and I think I'm the high trap F-14D pilot. Um, because I flew it the entire career, and I think I was the only only guy who did. Um, uh, so I ended up with um, a little over twenty six hundred hours 
um, and uh, over 700 tracks. Nice. Uh, in the uh, I have 1,004 overall and uh, something pushing 5,000 hours total. I'm 4,800. Oh, wow. Okay. That's a lot. It's more than I got. I did, uh, you know, I got... I, I, I flew, so I never deployed in Hornets or Super Hornets. I only deployed in Tomcats. And uh, uh, I still think I only ended up with, God, I think I came up with 650 traps is what I had total. And most of those are, are Tomcat traps, right? Uh, the vast majority of them. But uh, it, it's funny to hear you say that because it's all kind of luck of the draw as to what how that goes. And it sounds like you scored because I tell you what, I was flying. Uh, I did. I absolutely did. And, I, and, there were, and there were pluses and minuses there too, Crunch. Because I, I would have ended up with about 700 and change overall. You know, um, But I did a, a, a Tracon tour in the middle. Yeah. You, know, um, you know, when we closed down Miramar, there was – you know, Top Gun moved and, and the uh, West Coast fighter squad, uh, training debt had not stood up yet. And, you know, there was not a lot of places to go if you weren't going to the RAG. And, um, and the, the TRACOM was calling and they needed people down there badly and they were flying their butts off. And, uh, and so a couple, of, a couple of people who I knew and trusted were already there and told me it's a great time. Come on down. And so I did. And I got, I ended up with, um, I was there two and a half years. I flew 1,500 hours in those two and a half years Man. And, uh, and got 250 traps or something like that, 187. I can't remember exactly what was in the T-45. Yeah. I flew my butt off down there, and that was wonderful. You know? and we'll actually talk a little bit more about that later, I think. Um, not the T-45, but how that plays in to uh, Top Gun later. All right. Sounds so before, before we get into things, though, I uh, – I wasn't that familiar with your career. What was your Super Hornet experience, Jungle? I'm, if you don't mind, uh, sure. Uh, so when <laughs> I, I think that's going. I think that's going to add perspective to some later discussion. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I, I flew every piece of tactical, you know, every tactical jet aircraft the Navy had uh, while I was in. But were um, you in a Super Hornet squadron in the fleet? Uh, I was actually. I was. Uh, I was CAG ops for um, for CAG nine. <laughs> Uh, and I was flying a, a variety of airplanes. Uh, I was I was qualified in in all variants of the Hornet at the time, but I was I was fighting and, and pledged to to only CQ and one aircraft, and so I picked the F, um, uh, which was the closest to all of my other combat time and everything else. So uh, and had many of my own you know backseater buddies and everything else. Uh, so I, I chose to fly the. Um, the F in combat on my last tour. And that was okay. Uh, that's good. All right. Cool. Awesome. What well, crunch you ready to get started? I, uh, yeah, absolutely. You kick my, it off. Okay. Jungle. How about uh, going over, you know, top level view, some of the most significant improvements uh, brought to the fleet by the F 14 D and, and just, I mean, you know this, but to, uh, to let our uh, viewers know, we're going to have a, a separate episode coming soon on the APG 71 where we talked to an F-14D Rio. So, uh, so we're going to ask jungle to just focus on the uh, front seat, you know, but we'll get into some backseat stuff and crew coordination and stuff like that. Sure. So some of the biggest improvements that the D brought to the fleet. Well, first and foremost, well, I say first and foremost, the GEF 110s, um, that, that alone changed the way pilots could fly the airplane and how they could fight in the visual arena. Um, so that was a very significant upgrade. Um, the, you know, all variants of the Tomcat had the TCS, the television camera system. And that was good for visual identification inside of 10 to 12 miles kind of thing. Um, it was a nice seventies kind of technology and it, and it worked sometimes. I mean, it worked and it was useful sometimes, but what really separated the D was our sensors, right? So we had our infrared search and track system, the, the first, um, uh, the APG-71, uh, which was a fantastic radar, uh, JTIDs, Link-16, which would later be called MIDS, um, and then, you know, our HUD and all new displays, and even things like our bull chaff and flares, uh, those were our AIM-9 rails that were uh, modified to carry hundreds of rounds of chaff or flares instead of just our standard buckets of 30. Uh, and it made a huge, huge difference in 
Um, <laughs> Battlefield SA, our ability to fight offensively, defensively. Um, you know, we, I think, you know, as we go through today, you know, I think I can point to a few examples where, you know, the people who knew the most on the battlefield were the, you know, four air crew in a section of F-14Ds. Um, it, it, because we were a hub of, of sensor information and data link. It was, it was fantastic. It was exactly where the information needed to be. Yeah. So, Jungle, we're going to we're absolutely we're going to get uh, in the next discussion after this. We're going to get uh, a Rio on here to talk about JTIDs and MIDs, Link sixteen, and all that. But that's that's going to be for. There's no reason we can't skip that right now. I'd love it if you could dive into that. You know, you and I sat in the front seat of the D, and we had some of that data displayed to us. And it, how did think thinking back to it? How did that help you? Crunch, I don't, yeah, I think that's perfect because, because that what I'm getting from Jungle talking is that the D was a lot more than just big engines it, yeah. oh, and yeah. new radar. So go ahead, you know, this is. Sure. Well, it's really interesting. So that the F 14D was a canceled program before it was ever delivered, you know, and, and as such, you know, the, the, the total build got cut way down and, and the delivery was delayed. Um, and the various boxes and software was also kind of slow to, to arrive. So the, we, I was with VF31 for two years before we, before we finally deployed, or even two and a half years before we finally deployed. And all that time was spent just kind of getting all our stuff and building and getting the software and getting the boxes in and getting our crews trained, our maintainers trained. And, um, and it was always a pain, right? I mean, all those boxes that showed up, all the software that showed up, and there were all kinds of problems and integration problems. And the overall integration was, you know, this was back, you know, a cutting edge PC was a 486, right? I mean, so so the integration was you know, limited at best. But one of the things that showed up that worked literally right out of the box, open up the box, take off the packaging, plug it into the airplane, and it worked just like advertised or better was the Erst. Um, that that thing was beautiful. It was running from the front seat uh, in, in all the squadrons that I was in. Um, and uh, if it flew through the air, we could see it. It did not matter what it was made of, what shape it was. If it was moving, we could see it. And it, you know, it was tracking long, long way by art, and we could track it a long way. Um, and we could data link bearing lines because, you know, we'd have a little passive range capability. Um, you know, you do a little maneuver and it would calculate the range for your approximate range. Um, and you could get, you could shoot an AIM-54 on that approximate range uh, with some piece of probability of kill. But what we like to, what I like to do is push my wingman out about 10 miles and we'd link each other our, our bearing lines. And uh, then you know exactly where he was, you know, and uh, we were doing that and, in 1993, yeah. you know, it worked like a chance. And just, just for the uh, watchers and the listeners, the, the, you're talking about the IRST, which is an acronym, IRST, Infrared Search and Track. And many of the right. enthusiasts out there will recognize an F-14D when they're looking at it, because right underneath the chin of the radar dome, there's going to be one little cylinder that's the television camera system. And on the D, you've got two of them side by side, and one of them has a big globe that half – dark globe. And that's the, the earth, the infrared search and track. And, uh, so it, yeah, I, I've got some time with that. I was, I loved the earth. I think it was amazing. It sounds to me like you used it at a higher level than I did. Uh, I know that we would link back and forth, but there was, uh, the, you know, fighter to fighter data link was there, there was fighter to fighter in the F-14 A, B and D just at different levels and different pieces of information you could throw out there in the D. Uh, yeah, I loved the Earth because you could be going down range and, you know, you pull somebody up on the Earth and you go, bang, eyeball two. You know, near group is, you know, quantity two. Right. You just it's, say, there it is. I can see it. And it's absolutely amazing. Go ahead. Yeah, no, the, the, the cell resolution was fantastic on the Earth. So even, you know, the APG-71 could, could track a Coke can if it was going 60 knots a long way away. Um, but you couldn't break out, you know, the, the res cell was huge it was roughly the size of three or four aircraft um and an earth you know you, you could count up you could count up the individual aircraft no problem out there so you could you could determine right off the bat whether you were looking at an airliner or a group of four fighters you know i mean 
And if they're coming from northern Iraq, that's pretty good indicator is what you're looking at. You know? That's right. Dad, can you describe for the, the watchers and listeners what that display looked like? Um, sure. Yeah, it was, you know, it'd be archaic uh, by today's standards. But um, but back then it was a green screen. Um, uh, we typically had it up, on, you know, there was, a, there was a center MFD and a right MFD. I'd typically have it up on the right hand MFD. Um, and... Uh, everything was controlled hotaz, hands on throttle and stick. And so there was a, a cursor on the front of the throttle and I could run, I'd, I'd pull up Erst and I could run the cursors around and, and have the Erst look and change modes, uh, zoom in SCT and do a, 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 all kinds of different things. And the, the key was to zoom in, right? So you had a nice field of view and it would track and, and highlight tracks for you. And then you could just come in and zoom in on them and just, and just take a look and see what they were, how many were in there, um, and then zoom back out again. And um, and it did integrate nicely into the TSD, so uh, the tactical situation display that was in my center display. Uh, so I had all of that information in the top-down view, and this was in the uh, Earth was typically a uh, uh, out. Uh, yeah, you know, I forgot what you what you call it, but the uh, looking straight ahead out of the aircraft view. Yeah, stadium view, we'll say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a uh, um, yeah, oh shoot, where was I going with that? It's a uh, oh, in the the big thing with the IR search and track, the Earth that I think uh, may be news to some folks is it almost operated like a radar in the sense that it had a search function and you could define that scan volume. Uh, you could be looking at a track and it would develop. It would develop. It would, you would see it visually on your display, and the processor would actually say, "Hey, there's a target. I'm going to." either track that and figure out what bearing it's on, or you, as you said, get an SDT single target track, actually lock onto it. And it would maintain that a track on that, that target. And it was absolutely incredible. And one of the best things I thought about it was you could sit there and have, let's say you're looking at a target on your radar and they might maneuver into the beam so that they, they have pulse top the radar. We could talk about this at length, but when you maneuver into the beam, it makes it harder for the radar to see it. Whereas if you slaved the, the earth to it, boom, it looks down that line of sight, you pick it up, you create an STT with your earth and you can track them through the notch. And as he soon pops out, boom, you put your radar back on that line of bearing, you pick them right up. It was absolutely one of the best things I loved about it. Yeah, it was fantastic. And that was coordination between the front and back seat. And I'm sure Fun will talk about it yeah. uh, in the next episode. But he had a little box that was the, <laughs> the integration box sitting on top of the, uh, his uh, glare shield. That's right. I forgot about that. And he could slave, you know, he could select whatever the master sensor was and slave all the other sensors to it. And so a good RO, uh, when, we, when we detected those kinds of maneuvers to defeat our radar tracks or potentially... Uh, defeat our radar track. They would just, if the pilot knew his, knew what he was doing and had some Erst game, he'd throw the Erst on, and the uh, Rio could could uh, slave the radar to the Erst, and it would just track nicely until the guy came hot again. And, yeah. You know. Shoot him right in the lips. So it's interesting what you just said. If you have a pilot with some er good Erst game, uh, you grew up with the Erst from a from a young pup. I, on the other hand, had uh, I had about I don't know fifteen hundred Tomcat hours before I flew a D for the first time. I had A and B time and, and things like that, maybe less. I don't know, but uh, I ended up flying it for half my career. But until that point, I had when I showed up in the beginning, I was a train officer. I was a senior lieutenant, almost an 04. Here you are. Here's an F fourteen D, and I'm like. Wow, I'm a Top Gun guy. I know all about this stuff, and I had—I didn't have Earth game. I had to learn that, and it was—it's not as simple as it sounds. There's a lot of switchology. There's a lot of uh, moving back and forth, and whether it's you know moving that little cursor with that that uh, index finger, it, it was not mechanized well. Yeah. No, it was kind of hard. I don't remember the exact deal with it, but there was something about uh, selecting. Like if you pushed it down, oh, it, was, it would select on release, didn't it? It would. It would, and you could when you press down. If you didn't press straight into the throttle, right. if you if you did one of these, you know, it would miss. Yeah, it it definitely took. You have you almost had to hover your other fingers over the throttle and and just whack the uh, the cursor straight down. Yeah, that's it's interesting. You're bringing me back. I'd forgotten all about that. But there's a there's yeah. a pretty steep learning curve with some of those systems in the F14 in the front seat uh, in the D because I know that I had I had to learn quite a bit and what you were talking about of you know putting those the you know communicating with the uh, the Rio and and putting those systems together where one can hand off to the other there's a lot of switches and well 
Is there a lot of switches? There was a lot of knowledge going on to make that happen. Let's put it that way. There was. Uh, there's. There's no. There's no doubt. I mean, it was. You know, as computer technology got better and and software got better, integration got better. You know, it got easier in the cockpit. The Super Hornet was a great example yeah. of that, and the F thirty five now. Um, this was the beginning of that. You know, and it was. Uh, it definitely had big holes, but it worked, and uh, you just had to. You just had to practice in the the nice thing is, is that the the Tomcat, the Super Tomcat, was del uh, delayed in its delivery about a year, but the simulators were up and running very early, uh, and so they they had no schedule. And so uh, me and a couple of the guys had the keys to the building. We'd go in there, and we just fly all day every day, you know, and in the simulators and and work all of those systems, you know, mm. just do everything we could think of. Uh, very so, professional. Yeah, hey, you know what? I was I was a lifelong A guy. And this discussion, just to this point, just makes me so sad that the that the D was such a small part of the Tomcat, you know, and if experience. We, Crunch can speak to this too, Bio, but but we um, it was I shouldn't say it was worse than even that. It's not exactly true, but no, go ahead. We're <laughs> but the, well, you know, the worst thing they ever did was call the Super Tomcat an F fourteen, right? They should have just called it an F twenty eight or an F ninety nine. <clears throat> it looked just like an A, and when it went to uh, squadrons, you know, everybody treated it like an A. Um, you know, the maintainers and the air crew, and they, they flew it like an A. And, and it, it, it was only, early on, it was only the idiots that were never, that didn't know any of the vulnerabilities or insecurities of the A or, you know, any of that. We, we didn't know any of that, you know. And, uh, and so we were just out there being stupid and, you know, doing burner tail slides and tumbling the airplane and spinning it and having a grand old time with it. Um, and, uh, and meanwhile, you know, you know, maintenance control is handing us an airplane with no HUD and a few other things. So, well, the A doesn't have it. What do you need it for? You know, kind of stuff. And so it was hard to even get, and, and again, it was a canceled program. It wasn't the maintainer's fault too, either. I mean, there, there just weren't any parts for it. You know, the ASPJs and, and uh, uh, airborne self protection jammer, you know, those those sat in the warehouse in San Diego most of the career of the Tomcat. You know, we broke them out finally in time for the war, but uh, but right at the end of the, you know, and they worked like a champ. But, you know, we had to go write the manuals for it, you know, and, and figure yeah. out how to install it, and how to tune it and how to make it all work. And it was it was challenging the whole way for, you know, all 15 years, whatever it was. You know, it was it was. It was okay, I'm going to say two, two more quick things. One, uh, when you said they treated it like an A, it reminds me of something that I thought about. And this is this is something I didn't think about at the time. But when I look back on it, my, when I joined the uh, F-14 community in 1981, and then what I've talked to other guys about before that, a, a lot of times the first Tomcats were treated like Phantoms. Right. I mean, it's so. True. Yeah, it's true. Uh, it's and a then, yeah. And then the other thing is, um, I remember when I was at Top Gun in the mid 1980s, we'd get updates and and we were getting the plans for the D and they were going, oh, we're going to make an all F-14 D fleet. And everybody's going, yeah. And then they're going, OK, no, now we're going to do this. And it, it changed about every six months. And and as we, we've already said, they ended up making 55 of them. But oh, yeah, well, you get what you get. So they were glorious. Yeah. But yeah, I, I don't. Yeah, we could. I think we could go into in depth on originally. I was thinking hey, we would talk about that in depth, but it's almost like disheartening to think about all the yeah. politics that went into that. I, I don't think I got the energy in me to talk about why that happened. But uh uh, okay, so so let me put us back in the cockpit, Jungle. This is something that I thought about. Again, I was an I was an A guy, so I didn't have any time with the D. I didn't certainly didn't practice with it. And, and you mentioned practicing. Was the air crew uh, uh, sometimes overwhelmed, or could be overwhelmed by all the different sensors and all the information, or were you you know were you guys aware of that and managing information? Well, information the, the flow? displays were cleaner than than the F fourteen A and B. Um, so, so getting more situational awareness, and we had more sensors, and um, so getting situational awareness was, I think, easier in the D. Um, one of the things that definitely took some getting used to was uh, the four radios, right? We had we had uh, UH, you know UHF one and two, and then JTIDs one and two, and in country. 
all four of them would be used constantly. Um, and you, know, you just set your volumes differently so that, you know, you can tell which radio it was by either the preceding tone or the volume. Um, and then, you know, crunch talked to something that was important too, which is, you know, we had not everybody who flew, uh, you know, I mean, there was only five pilots who were D, D babies, you know, um, the, well, that's not true. I guess the, all the follow on classes were too, but, um, you know, all the leadership that came in, a lot of, a lot of very senior air crew and talented air crew that came in like crunch would come in and early on, they're already in leadership positions. So they're leading, you know, strikes or divisions. And they're, when you're doing that, you're, con you're controlling and you need the SA for all of your airplanes, not just yours. And then you're also trying to run a new system that you've never run. And, and that's where, you know, that would become overwhelming and guys would just punt it. I don't need this right now. I need to focus on leading my strike. And, and, you know, that was the right thing to do. And everybody, everybody did that, I think, gracefully uh, when needed. And, you know, things like the Urus could be run from the back seat as well. So, um, so if you were leading, you could put a senior RO in the back too. And, and he, he might have very nice air scan as well. Um, but, uh, but overall, I think that operating the systems between a good crew worked well in that airplane. Um, it, there were definitely times when you're early on, yeah, it was, it was a lot of information. And as you know, I would just degrade to a nose gunner, you know, I, I, I would listen in the debrief and I'd hear all these comm calls. I was like, I swear that didn't get to my headset during the fight. I didn't hear a single one of those calls. I just saw a bunch of F-16s go by and I turned on them, you know, I mean, that was, uh, there were definitely times when the SA bucket was that low. You know? This is true, especially if you get to it, like you said, you get those four radios going and, uh, it, you know, especially, you know, you go in country on a real mission and you get all four radios going and it can be absolutely overwhelming. And if you don't have a good plan in your brain of how to manage it, next thing you know, you're losing everything. And rather than, you know, task shedding it, as we say, of what you should, that's absolutely amazing. Yeah. Add, add a couple of MIGs and, um, uh, you know, a couple of Fox bats launching and some triple a and an, right. you know, an SA2 active. And, oh no, by the way, it's nighttime and you got in, uh, night vision goggles on, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, it, it got busy. Uh -huh. it, it definitely got busy. You know, your, your anti jam was hopping at a slightly wrong rate and, you know, you could only hear about you know five out of eight syllables. And, yeah. It was, Oh yeah, it was good stuff, man. Yeah. Oh, that's right. You're taking me back a little bit. This actually sounds like one of the strikes that was on. Holy cow! Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Sometimes you just want to say, "That's it. I'm going home. I can't do this." Oh wow! Oh, well, well, that's great. Well, hey, um, let, let's let's go uh, let's go stick and rudder for a second here. So uh, a, a few episodes ago, we had Slammer on here. You know Slammer. Yeah, Slammer. Slammer was a rag instructor of mine back in the, in uh, the Miramar days at, at uh, 124. Uh, great pilot, uh, flew with him around the various bases where Tomcats were most of my career. Yeah. yeah it was awesome. Yeah. yeah he, he had a great, we had a, we had a great interview with Slammer. I mean, what, what a great pilot, what a uh, great, a great friend of all of ours. He had a, a, a very interesting thing that he said, uh, which I was, I had, I actually kept thinking about it afterwards. Cause I was like, wow, that was really profound. If you will. What he said was the Tomcat was easy to fly, but difficult to fly well. And I would love to have your, uh, your thoughts on that. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, I, I'll say that the F-14A was probably even harder to fly well than the F-14D. Um, but the Hornet and all of the airplanes that follow are very easy to fly. I mean, you know, I, I flew all variants of the Hornet and the F-16 and, and they're, they're point and shoot kind of airplanes because they're, they're fly by wire. And, so you're you're telling the airplane what you want to do, and it's it's deciding you know it's interpreting your stick and and rudder movements, and then applying what will make the airplane do that in that flight regime. Um, so it's very simple, and it won't ever get away from you for the most part. You know there are some exceptions. Um, the Tomcat was a very honest airplane because it was not fly by wire; it was positively stable in all axes in almost all right, but in all flight regimes. Um, so it was, it was honest, you know, you, and, and the, the flight controls were reversed at a certain alpha and, and all of those things that every normal airplane would do all through history until fly by wire. And the Tomcat would usually give you a warning that it was going to try and kill you. And, and um, if you put enough energy, if you're going fast enough and you kind of slap the stick, 
you know, like a rolling pull, a sudden application, the airplane would, would start one way and then it would give you a head nod the other, you know, and, 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 and if you kept pulling, if you kept insisting, I want to go up and left and it would give you an up and left and then it'd come back down and right and it'd come up and left and come back down and right. It's saying, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. And about the third one, it would take off and you'd be off and running. Um, and the airplane could get away from you. you, you when you were up at high alpha or if you were at high speed and you made poor flight control inputs, you know, you, you could, you could hurt yourself. Um, you could definitely lose control of the airplane. Uh, that happened all the time. And so being able to use that to your advantage, uh, once you've had the GE engines, you didn't have any reason to be afraid of compressor stalls. The airplane more or less was invincible. The engines were more or less. And, um, and so I could pick up a much higher yaw rate than I could a pitch rate in that airplane. And we use that all the time. Full cross control, a little opposite throttle, whap and make the nose slice through at, you know, 45, 60 degrees per second. Stop right there. And, and the guy thinks he's defensive instantly. You know, I just moved the nose, you know, 60 to 70 degrees in, in a second or two. And, um, so it was um, it was hard to see, fly well. See, in, in an F-14A, that would be lock your harness. We're right, going right, for the ride. Right. We, but we it reminds me all the time. Yeah, and that was that was. It reminds movie. me on on our second episode, uh, we talked to Streak and Lur, who were uh, in the first Tomcat squadrons. Yeah, and they talked. Streak talked about a last ditch guns defense, which was cross control, depart the airplane, because the TF thirty at that time. Did not have its problems, I guess, or whatever. They certainly didn't know about them. So it sounds like you got and and they were flying the Tomcat like, like you know, crazy men. Which sounds like you guys were almost doing. Which had to be a great way to fly a big fighter. It was. It was a lot of fun. And um, and so you, you heard this a lot, and I still hear it uh, from from buddies um, from various communities. You you hear the Hornet guys. Obviously, a Hornet Tomcat rivalry. And uh, you'd hear the Hornet guys, you know, who, you know, a Hornet J.O. who had 400 hours in the Hornet could go out and fight a Tomcat J.O. who had 400 hours in the Tomcat and do pretty well. It was a much easier airplane to fight um, uh, or fly. The Tomcat, though, once you understood it, right, it was it was like a transformer, man. I mean. The wings changed, the geometry changed, the, the leading edge changed, the trailing edge changed, the position of the elevators relative to your stick position changed. And once you understood all that, and once you understood what that meant in the air and what that advantage, uh, you know, why it was built to do that, why it was that way, and how to use it, you were more or less invincible. You just had to have, you know, you had to be prepared to be patient. And let a Hornet guy gain, you know, 20 degrees on you one turn. Yeah, big deal. He's going to be in a bucket and won't be able to get any of his energy back. Meanwhile, you know, I could I could loop out of a flat suitor with the Tomcat uh, or the Super Tomcat um, and uh, and just strafe the heck out of guys, you know, that are stuck in a Luffberry on the deck. So it took, it took a while to get there. Yeah. Well, that's it. it so uh, that... It, it's funny you say that. So then, you know, I'm sure you've had a lot of time fighting Hornets in, in the Super Tomcat. Did you get a chance to ever fight like F -F F-15s, F-16s? Probably at the gun school you did, I'm sure, right? Sure, yeah. So we we had, when we first stood up, or when we when we first got the Ds in VF-31, uh, our skipper was a guy by the name of uh, Pogo Clark. World famous. Great American. Man, yeah. he is a great guy. Yeah, world famous fighter pilot. Uh, and, and Vietnam war hero, you know, that guy was a super stud. Um, and, um, I had the, I had the, the great honor of, of flying as his dash four for six months and then flying as his wingman for a year. And at the end of every flight, uh, we would do at least one or two BFM sets and he would kick my ass every sortie, every engagement for a year. Um, and then I swear I almost never lost again, you know, after that, I mean, he, he was so damn good, but once you got it, you know, it was, it was, it was a tough airplane to beat once you understood how to fly it. Um, but so with Pogo there and the new airplane there, everybody wanted to come fight him. All right. Everybody wanted to come fight VF-31s and we would go on the road or sometimes they'd come to us. 
Uh, we fought everybody there was. We fought F-16s, we fought Eagles, we fought Strike Eagles, um, uh, Hornets, Canadian Hornets, uh, you know, everybody. And, um, and we did extremely well. One, some of my favorite uh, stories come out of going to Nellis. You know, they, they, um, they were curious and open-minded, you know, uh, they were not, um, you know, arrogant jerks or anything like that. You know, they wanted us to come up and they wanted us to show us what, what we had or show them what we had. And, uh, so I went out and two JOs, uh, went out, um, uh, went out and fought their operations officer and their executive officer of the uh, Eagle Weapon School. And we learned uh, a lot uh, on those hops. Um, and the Eagle is a magnificent fighter, right? I mean, it, it, it's a great machine. Um, it's, you know, big and fast. It carries a lot of uh, weapons and, you know, all of those things. And we're big and fast and go fast, and, you know, and carry a bunch of weapons and shoot long range. And, and so when we're doing a straight up Eagle versus straight up Super Tomcat runs, we could detect them earlier, obviously. We could shoot much earlier, obviously. And then they had some choices to make, you know, whether to preemptively try to defend against some long range shots, which they don't know whether they were taken or not. Um, come back in and then, then they had to face whether or not we had chosen to hold on to those long range shots with the game 54 and shoot at them again. And, but of course, by then they're, they're trying to shoot some rammers at us, some amrams at us. And so assuming that all of the forward quarter work, you know, we were good enough to survive to the merge. Then we're getting into the visual arena with the Eagles. And, uh, and that was a very clear line. Um, you know, it, it, obviously the person in the machine is what matters most, but if they're roughly equal, the Eagle was much better turning above 20,000 feet, right? The, the last thing you'd want to do with a, with a super Tomcat or any Tomcat would be to hit a merge at like 35,000 feet with an Eagle because our wing sweep programmers, you know, you could always sweep them further aft, but you could never sweep them further forward. And so, and it was based on cues. So the higher you were and the faster you were, the more the wings would sweep. And you know, so you, you say Q, but the NATOPS for the, for the audience says indicate a mock number. Um, okay. I'll take it. I'll take it. I mean, just cause some people may not be comfortable with Q. Okay. Yes. Um, so, uh, anyway, to get back to your point, yeah, fighting well, the Eagles high and low. What's interesting is that, is, is that an A NATOPS or a D NATOPS? Oh, oh, excellent point. Accepted. That's an A NATOPS. Cause it should be, it's, it's essentially, it's a distinction without a difference, but We've always talked Q, and I, I wonder if that was just a community thing or not. I, I doubt it. Yeah, I, I don't I'm, know. They could they could easily reprogram the CADC. I mean, that, yeah. it's a computer. Well, I bet I'm wrong. I'm sure it's the same. I I always thought it was programmed off mock, but it could have changed. It, it could have changed. That I no, I bet I bet I'm wrong. It's it's uh that's interesting. Anyway, but it's but it's close. It's but but I'm sorry to interrupt your story, but no, but you're right. talking about but it's engaging at thirty five thousand. Right. So that's the point, right? Is that is that if we hit uh, emerge up there and we start to turn, you know, our wings are 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 uh, swept much more than than the eagle, and the eagle is that beautiful wing designed to turn at high altitude, maneuver up there, and you'd be in a hurt locker in a big hurry. So fortunately for us, though, all the maneuvering to defeat forward quarter shots would typically take the fight downhill. And by the time you're down below 20,000 feet, our wings are out nice and straight. We've got, you know, 60,000 pounds of thrust. And that eagle's wing now is working against it. And, uh, and so once we got down low, we would start to, to absolutely dominate those airplanes. Again, kind of similar pilots. Um, so it was really, really interesting. The, the F-16 and the F-18, um, it was, those were relatively simple fights. Um, and again, it, it all comes down to the person and the machine. But given similar pilots, the F-18 and the F-16 were fly-by-wire aircraft, meaning that, you know, their, their flight envelopes were completely controlled by the computer. The pilot was just choosing where in that envelope to go. And Chuck Yeager himself could not move it out of that envelope, you know. Um, so no, no matter who you were fighting, you were fighting that machine, you know, um, and it could do no more than what it would let it, what, what, what it would let it do. And so if you knew that about the F-16 or the F-18, you could just figure out a way to get the airplane down low, get it slow. And, and the F-18 in particular had a very hard time getting its knots back 
um, once it was up at high alpha, you know, it was so draggy and it just didn't have enough for us to really fly out of that bucket. Um, and meanwhile, the, you know, down low, the, the Tomcat with this big straight wing and his, and the big engines were just eating alive. And, and the same for the Viper, you know, I mean, you, you just have to accept that it's going to have both of those airplanes are going to have a higher rate than you when you hit the merge. You know, it's going to have higher G, it's going to really come. The, the F-18 has a huge alpha. So, I mean, you can just pull and sacrifice all these knots and just point right at you. Um, and you have to be able to defend um, to survive, right? You know, you have to be able to defend that. And once you do, that guy's done. You know, he's never going to shoot at you again. Fantastic. You know, it's too bad we don't have, you know, a half dozen uh, HUD videos that we could just pop in here and stuff <laughs> like that. Yeah. If you have any of those in uh, stashed away, uh, let us know and we'll, we'll work them in somewhere. Yeah, I, I might have some actually, uh, some unclass stuff. I, I I don't know what kind of shape it's in. I haven't looked at it in years, but uh, I might have some. Uh, Jung, you feel like talking about uh, your Top Gun experience, uh, Top Gun instructor experience, and the F fourteen and other things? Sure. Let, let's go there. What was your uh, SME area at Top Gun? Well, when were you there? What years were you there? So I was there from oh um, uh, three, end of oh three to end of oh five. Uh, so three ah, years okay, so you were after. Did you know Jello and uh, Crunch as instructors? Uh, Crunch, or? I think, was gone just before I got there. Is I have that right? That's right. Yep. And um, okay. I came in as the, the deputy N seven, or you know what used to be called the XO, and uh, uh, and okay. yeah, took over Strike Fighter Veterans, um, which was basically the integration. I, I I was one of the last briefs and I integrated all of the building block briefs into, you know, missions, various missions on the battlefield. Strike, um, what was it called? Strike fighter? Strike fighter missions. Strike fighter missions. Okay. Yeah. Got it. So we talked about all the various big picture ways in which, yeah, we'd, we'd be uh, uh, called into action on the battlefield, including a bunch of stuff that we weren't currently doing, but that we needed to maintain the ability. While you were there at Top Gun, you know, a lot of times we talked about the Crad 1v1 and uh, and some things like that. We talked about that before. So folks who have listened to some of our other uh, podcasts, they know what this is. But for other folks, Crad 1v1, you know, you show up in the uh, in the auditorium, you get an envelope with an altitude, a cap position, a, a radar frequency, and a call sign. You, you flow in, you hit the merge, and you fight whoever's there. So do you have any great stories of the Crad 1v1 when you were there? Anytime. And I tell you, it was that, – that- that one individual event is, you know, a, a dream come true, right? I mean, that is that is just old school as old school can get, and it teaches great lessons too. And it's right at the end of the class, and the students uh, are at their peak peak of their game, but they haven't flown a lot of BFM, and a lot of them a lot of them realize just how perishable that skill is. But uh, um, yeah, I probably the most unique story for grab one V one for me was when I went, uh, as an invitee, um, from T 45s. So, you know, I was down in Sinatra and, oh. and uh, cool. flying T 45s and, uh, the T 45 is, you know, it's, it's not a tactical airplane. I mean, it's got a stick. If I remember, uh, I think yeah. I was at Top Gun when you did that. Was that like 2000, 2001? Yeah, so we, Skids Crosby was there with you, I think. No, he was performing. He was performing. Before, okay. okay. No, Skids, Skids was the guy. I, I came twice. Okay. Um, the first first time um, I fought an F5 with uh, uh, a banded F5. But the second time, and, you know, I had no business winning that, but... Um, for the second time, I ended up fighting a, a class student, uh, F-14, uh, and, and uh, beat him three out of three. And, um, and the T-45 had no business out there, right? It had like 3,000 pounds of thrust at sea level. Um, and we're, you know, we're starting at 22,000, you know, and it, it would take me, you know, we're in Bravo, you know, we're in um, Dixie North, and we're, you know, the Tomcats back up to set up the next fight, and I'm, I'm we're having to do in place turns seven times as I'm going <laughs> climbing, you know, up to twenty two thousand feet. And um, but I'll tell you, Chris, the the thing was is that I was the BFM SME, the, you know, the basic fighter maneuvering SME for all of Sinatra, and I was flying three BFM hops a day for two and a half years. You know, I mean, I, I flew to the boat, too, but most of the time I was just dogfighting all day, every day. And it was against students, but I was teaching, and, 
and teaching IUT and, and everything. And, and there was nobody more current than me on the planet Earth, you know, and and uh, and so for one class, they had they had a hard time finding enough people to come, enough enough bandits to come. And Skids Crosby and I were both D babies. And he's like, you know, you ever give this guy Jungle a call down there in Kingsville? And and uh, there, you know, there was a huge uproar. No, you know, orange and white can't have that. And uh, and of course, I got this call. And I, I I had to convince Sinatra to let me go. I mean, it was just absurd. Uh, we did it on 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 com brevity, com standardization. It was going to help me, you know, improve the uh, the training command training. <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and they bought that. Uh, oh yeah. And I, uh, I didn't sleep. I swear to God, I did not sleep for like two weeks prior to this because I knew, I knew from my upbringing, I knew from all of my fighter training that I should, win. I should win. And there was no way that I should win. It was two absolutely ridiculous ideas in my head. There was nobody more current than me. Therefore, I should win. And uh, and my airplane had no business up there, uh, so I had no chance. And uh, and I thought about every possible way to fight. Um, and you don't even know who you're going to fight, right? You just show up. All I knew is that every one of them was going to be better than me. And, um, and uh, yeah, I never, I never lost in 245. <laughs> uh, I went seven for seven, I think. That's crazy. Uh, and, and yeah. I, you know, I did, a, I did a training command tour myself, and I did a lot of, a lot of BFM. Uh, I don't remember ever having the opportunity to go fight a fleet fighter in the T-45. That would have been a lot of fun. I'm so jealous that you got a chance to do that. That's how that it was it. so much fun. It was a blast. It was an absolute blast. And it validated it absolutely validated what Rick Toffin said back in the day, right? I mean, it, he, he said, uh, the quality of the box matters little. It's the man in it that matters. And it, it's not that I was any great fighter pilot or anything. It's just nobody was more current than me. You know, I mean, the, the last, I, I, I mean, I was, nobody on the planet was flying more dog than me uh, at that time. Therefore, I should have, I should have won. I, according to everything that I had ever been taught, I should have won. <laughs> It, it that that like also it. reiterates what Slammer said when he was uh, CEO of the RAG. He would he would take an A model, Tomcat, and he'd fight students in D's, and he'd beat them all the, all time, the time. Which makes the <laughs> yeah. same point because yeah. he was smart. Yeah, yeah, he was really good. Though. He was he's very smooth pilot. I mean, he, he, <laughs> he could make that A. You, you right. couldn't tell what he was flying. You know, he, he, well, that's why we all know him, you know, and yeah. <laughs> know of him and everything. Yeah. yeah. Hey, you ready to uh, switch over to uh, combat jungle? You're ready to go back to, uh, to combat. Sure. So uh, tell us about uh, taking the F-14 D into combat. What years, uh, what squadrons uh, are some of your combat experiences and some of the reasons why the D was, uh, I'm certain it was your favorite airplane to, uh, to go in of all your options to go into combat. It, it was, I, I would, um, if there was ever an air to air, to air threat at all, ever, you know, uh, I'd, I'd rather be in the D than anything else. Uh, for some close air support, that that uh, Super Hornet, it was it was painfully slow, couldn't get out of its own way. But uh, boy, what a great! Oh, ouch! It, it I, thought you, gonna, I, mean, it really I thought you were going to give it a, a, a thumbs up, but <laughs> well, okay. it was a great close air support airplane, right? I mean, it, it, it was just at the time there was nothing better in the world, and I don't know if there's anything better yet. Um, it's a magnificent close air support airplane, which the is the Tomcat. Really no, I'm sorry, the uh, the Super Hornet. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if there's any air to air threat at all, I'd, I'd rather be in the super Tomcat. Um, and the, uh, and so, yeah, I, so, I, I, I had, what I years, had, what years and where were you? Yeah. I got shot at every, every deployment I was on. Um, <laughs> my first deployment was, uh, 94, 95, um, uh, flying off the Carl Vinson with VF 31. And we were doing just OSW standard operation Southern watch stuff. Um, back when, back when we were doing it around the clock, right? So the carriers had midnight to noon, you know, and the air force had noon to midnight. And, uh, so I'd, you know, I'd be sitting on Texas cap at, you know, 3 AM watching the meteors fly, you know, that kind of stuff. I mean, you know, the Iraqis never flew at night. Um, but there we were, uh, but one of the cool missions there was tarps. Um, uh, and we were running, we were trying to prove that Saddam was, violating the various um un resolutions and that kind of stuff and and so uh so i got to rage around low um, in in the tomcat then and that was a lot of fun um but the the stuff that really showed off 
the Super Tomcat came in the next deployment, and that was with the F-213, um, 98, 99, and that was um, Operation Desert Fox was, was a couple of weeks in there, or maybe five days in there, but we were getting shot at all the time. I mean, we were getting shot at on average, I think, every other day. Or no, we were getting shot at every day, shooting back on average just about every other day. Um, MiGs were flying. They had more no-fly zone violations in those couple of months than all the other years combined, you know, up to that point. And uh, so it was fun. It was a great time. Saddam had a big bounty out on us. Uh, and called us he called us the Ravens of Evil fly, flying from Satan's flagship, you know. So it was, it was a spicy time. Um, and I, during that time, I took two live commits, um, you know, takes on, master arm on, and... Uh, and gate, you know, select the burners and get up to altitude and let's go get them. Um, and, and obviously both stories are fairly short because I didn't get any kills. Those guys turned around and ran as soon as they knew, as soon as they were aware. But, um, one was fairly standard. We were on, on Texas cap. And, um, and again, because of J tids, you know, the command and control structure was up J boys and nobody else was no Eagles. Nobody else was except for RE twos and our super Tomcats. And so there was some conversation going on and we could hear some very classified data flowing back and forth in the clear because it was, uh, or plain voice, I should say, because it was, it was uh, um, a secure radio. And so we could tell exactly what was going on on one particular mission. We knew that we wanted to stick around. And, uh, and so they started telling us to move south uh, because they wanted to move some Eagles in to get the kill. And uh, we're like, no, 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 we're not going south. And they're, you know, they're Jeremiah, I think was their call sign back then. Jeremiah's telling me to flow south. And I, I quickly flew over. There was a, a big SAM ring um, near uh, uh, was it Talil, uh, El Nazaria, you know. So I, I put myself over north of the SAM ring so I couldn't flow south into the SAM ring. And uh, say, I can't flow south. You know, I got a Sam ring there, you know. And, uh, and like Jeremiah actually came up and called me and said, you know, flow south. Yeah. All right. Yes. So I started flowing out of there and, uh, and they commit some eagles and it really ticked me off. So we we're, um, we we're finally flowing south. We flew south about 60 miles and, um, and the eagles could not affect the intercept on that uh, high fast flyer. We were eventually uh, asked if we could take the commit. Of course, we were getting pretty low on gas. Uh, we said, of course we could, and turned hot, uh, tapes off, master arm on, and, and uh, I had Stooley was my backseater, and uh, I had him, you know, he's, he's running the radar up, and he's also going through NATOPS trying to get me a high altitude bingo number into Kuwait because we were going to be that kind of low on gas. Wow. <laughs> Meanwhile, on J-Voice, I'm calling back to the ship saying, hey, push the S3s in country because I don't know if we're going to be able to make it to the tankers. And they did. So the, the ship pushed the S3s in. They got their uh, air metal points for that mission. Uh, and they came, a pair of S3s came racing in while we're going up after this uh, Fox bat. And, of course, 90 seconds later, maybe not even that long, uh, it was over. As soon as as soon as Iraq had some indicators that we were headed north, the Fox bat split and, uh, before anybody had a chance to do anything. Uh, so we all went home normally. It was no big deal. Um, but it was a good indicator of, or a good reflection of how much situational awareness an individual Super Tomcat crew could have on the battlefield. The next one was even, uh, even more, um, a, a better indicator. We were uh, assigned a strike. It was a mixed section, mixed division strike which we hated dragging the, the hornets around. They were so slow. Um, but, you know, it was kind of, that was kind of a legacy tactic from the A. You know, the, the F-18 had a better in-close radar than the A did, and they used to run mixed section, mixed division. And so, you know, here we are running mixed section, mixed division. And uh, we conduct this strike, and we were hitting a, 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 a comm node, and, uh, and we start getting tipper that um, MiG-23s are, are – um, I'll come. And of course, I'm I'm not very interested in the strike. You know, I'm very interested in that uh, in in those mid twenty threes. But it was my strike, and so we get in there and, and on, literally on the run, um, we hear that they're airborne and coming south. And so we now the only two airplanes that knew that was me and Dash Four, Dash One and Dash Four. The two Hornets in between have have none of the situational awareness yet. And so we get our bombs off. You know, boom, 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 everything looks great. And we're supposed to flow out to the south. And of course, 
I turn hot, you know, Masseron tapes on and commit. And I look down and, and here's my, my PPLI, the uh, JTIDS indicator where my wingman is. And dash four just turns right with me. And I look down, there he is. And we were at wings level and start booming for the sky. And, um, and the Hornet guys, I'm like, you know, uh, I forgot our call sign at the time, but jungle flight flow north. And the uh, dash two and dash three had these giant question marks over their head. They're like, why? And, uh, and so we're, we're talking to the controllers then. And, and the Hornet guys came with us. But they didn't, you know, they didn't accelerate. They couldn't. They didn't have enough gas to do that. We were way north. And they needed to go home, you know. So they, they just kind of kept flowing north for a while. And they ended up 20 miles behind us while we flew, you know, 40 miles north. You know, I mean, they were flying half our speed. And we're down about half our altitude. And, um, and then the mix turned around. And we turned around and everybody went home. But, um, but that was a perfect example of the Super Tomcat. In and those action. were super hornets, right? No, or, those were straight baby hornets. Those were super really, straight. yeah. Huh. And okay. They just, I mean, we were way up north. Uh, yeah, I mean, way up north being you know thirty second parallel. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we were a long way from anything, and they they just didn't have the gas to gate and they you know carrying stores and everything else. Um, you know that that airplane, the the hornet and the super hornet are wonderful self escorted strikers, right? But but they are strikers. <laughs> you know they're. They are not uh, able to move around the battlefield and control airspace um, the way a Tomcat could, you know. Um, and so, uh, I mean, the, one of the side stories was, uh, you know, years later, then on my last deployment, I'm in Super Hornets, and I have an F-14, a former F-14 Rio in my back seat, and we fly our first mission in country, and nothing much happened. This is in Afghanistan. It's fairly quiet. We come home. We're on the tanker. Uh, and it was our it was our habit in the Super Tomcat to take a little extra gas on the tanker heading back down towards the North Arabian Sea and then just come off the right side of the tanker and, and light the burners and go ripping by those guys and give them a little light show at night. You know, uh, so, so the tanker pilots would see 60 feet of blue flame coming out of the back of the Super Tomcat. And uh, and the Rio would say, hey, we're coming up your right side and we'll go down the boulevard in front of you. And uh, so. So we're getting our gas out of the Super Hornet, and uh, my Rio starts to say the exact same thing. Just out of habit, he's like, "Hey, you know, uh, you know, Rhino Four Seven is going to come up your right side." I'm like, "No, no, no!" And the uh, and the KC Ten that we're tanking off of laughs and accelerates and just walks away from us. And I'm in I'm in mill power, and the KC Ten is just walking away. And he's like, "Jungle, what are you doing, man?" You know, and I'm like, "Oh, you want to see burn?" <clears throat> plug in the burner and we accelerated like 0.03, you know, uh, Mach number and just sat there and watched the, you know, watched the, the, uh, the KC-10 walk away. I mean, it was, you know, a fully laden Hornet or Super Hornet was lethal if you came at it. You know, if you tried to attack it, it was a very dangerous machine. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but it was not a fighter, you know. Amazing. We could do a whole show on the Super Hornet. I mean, we could do a series on the Super Hornet. That's an amazing airplane, especially when you yeah. got, got amazing. Amazing. Airplane. Yeah, especially yeah. when you got into the ASA radar and all sorts of things. I mean, it's just an incredible killing machine. But you're right; it didn't have the it didn't have the the legs or the speed that somebody like a Tomcat has. Absolutely, it's, it's, an, it's an amazingly lethal machine. And yeah. Like I said, I, I would fly in close air support role over the Tomcat. Yeah. Um, it was better in every way in the close air support role, uh, essentially. And it is, and Crunch is absolutely right. I mean, it is a dangerous machine if you're trying to attack an AESA uh, equipped Super Hornet. Um, but, but, the, but the enemy gets to choose when it's going to fight, right? The enemy is going to be able to run away from the Hornet if it's defensive. If the, if the enemy is defensive and behind you know, behind its desired timeline, they can leave and choose when to come back and and attack that super hornet when it's not ready, not looking. You know, it's it's not a fighter. Yeah. You know, it's just very lethal uh, if you try and attack it. Hmm. Hey, so something else that uh, can, I, I meant to talk to you before when we were talking stick and rudder stuff, and uh, and that was it, it keep in my head just now because you were talking about the, you know the the super hornet being incredibly lethal because it, it took a lot. There were a lot of things that the F fourteen D had that I think were stolen by stolen is the wrong word 
uh, improved upon or transferred over to the Super Hornet. And, you know, the MIDs, JTIDs, Link 16, one of those things that was brought over. Uh, the, the F-14D had a much better Link 16 system than the Super Hornet did. I think that's that that's just true, right? And it's better than the F-15, better than the F-16. Everything about it was better. One of the other things that we have not talked about on the stick and rudder side was the HUD and the F-14D. And I just loved the HUD. It was big. It had so much information. It was absolutely beautiful. It, 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 I know that I think you feel the same way. Tell, tell me your thoughts on that. Yeah, it was, it was really, I don't know who designed um, that Super Tomcat HUD. Later, we would have some input into some modifications of it. But but whoever designed that HUD was an artist. I, they, they knew what they were doing. It was so smart. It was so well laid out. And we talked about, you know, how, how archaic the software was and the computers were. And even with that, by my right knee, I had a series of switches and, and uh, buttons that I could customize the HUD and change the display to, to put as much or as little information and change the form of the information you know, back in 1991, you know, it was marvelous. And, and one of my favorite things about that, and, and we all we all loved it, um, was it was called the potential, what was it, the potential energy? What was that? Thing uh, called? The potential energy cube. The potential energy cube. Thank you. And it was, uh, we all called it the power carrot. Yeah. Well, know? I mean, that's a, that's a great name to begin with. So, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was. It's exactly what it was. The potential, potential, potential energy cube. And all it was, so, you know, you have your, your flight path marker or your velocity vector, a uh, little airplane, a little, little circle with uh, wings and a, and a vertical tail. And that was where you were going through space, you know, and that relative to the attitude lines and pitch lines and everything would help you. That was your primary attitude reference for flying on instruments. And as you're coming down to the boat and you would dirty up, get your gear and flaps down, the potential energy cue would pop up. We call it the, the, the um, power carrot because that's how we use it. And it was just a little uh, V and a little pointer that would come up and point right next to the wingtip of the flight path marker. And it allowed, once we learned how to use it, if you add a little power, the, the, uh, the power carrot would jump up a little bit. If you pull a little power, it jumped down. And if you did anything, if you skidded the airplane, if you put any drag on the airplane, you would see the carrot come down. And what would follow invariably is that that was, that was telling you a trend, right? The, the, the velocity vector would likely start to come down or you would start to decelerate, right? The airplane would, you'd either start to come down or you'd start to decelerate or the opposite, right? You start to accelerate or start to go up. And, uh, and so the way we use this is um, you'd roll out in the groove uh, to come aboard the ship or at night on a long straight end, and you get everything in the suitcase, you get your line up all square away, you put the velocity vector up in the crotch of the ship, you know, the the uh, the corner of the angle and the uh, the bow. That's right, he said crotch, that's what we yeah. all called it. <laughs> you put the velocity vector up there, and uh, and then you just you just take that power carrot, and you know, the, the circle would be, you know, I forgot 10 mils or something like that in diameter. And you just take the power carrot and you'd move it up somewhere between the wingtip and the top, of the velocity vector and you just leave it there so you were ever so slightly overpowered and uh, and then just come on down the chute and you could use dlc and dlc is direct lift control and it controlled a couple of spoilers on the wings that the lso's the landing signal officers on the carrier deck could not see and uh and so you could just roll those out with a little thumb wheel on the stick and you could just bleed off a little bit of excess energy if you needed it. And if you hit a burble or anything like that, the airplane would just drive right through it. And you could just hold that all the way down and you'd make no power corrections at all or very few right to a three wire. And it sounded great, right? So when you're standing out on the platform with the LSOs, all you'd hear is just this smooth, steady increase of this jet noise to a trap as opposed to everybody else coming aboard. You know, and you're hearing the shots of power that guys are correctly doing, and uh, the Tomcat would just come aboard smooth as silk, man. And it was really nice. It was like cheating. I loved that thing. Yeah, oh, I had I had some of my best passes. I got into the F-14. It was it was like stealing. It became so wow. easy. And if and the funny part is is that uh, or funny part one of the neatest thing was if you ever got off parameters or like you roll out, let's say you come in for the 
the shit hot break and you're really fast, you roll around in the groove, you're going to be really fast. And that E bracket might be really low. I'm sorry, really high. And so you would just create an imaginary line between the center of the E bracket, which is your relative, you know, where you are on speed to your preferred speed for landing. And you'd line it up with your velocity vector. You put the, that energy cue, the power carry, right in an imaginary line. And bang, you would line it up. You'd just keep it in line. And it was the perfect correction every time. And it was just absolutely so smooth and so cool. And the funny part was, as an F-14A guy who grew up like, no, HUD, who needs a stinking HUD? You know, you'd roll out right. the groove with your spurs and shoot your six-shooter because you're a cowboy, right? And then you'd become, start flying the D and all of a sudden when your HUD goes away, you're sad. Really sad. <laughs> you know, very very sad. sad. I get it. Very, now. Very I need sad. my HUD. I need my yeah. HUD. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we became HUD cripples very quickly. I mean, you know, I was always a HUD cripple, but uh but yeah, we, you'd see the guys, you'd see some of the A guys come in and they'd be like, ah, you don't need a HUD, you know. Because we'd declare an emergency. You'd have no HUD at night and you'd be, you know, you'd be, ah, hey, we're no HUD, you know, and you get your straight in. And uh, the A guys, the old A guys, were like, ah. <laughs> and uh, and boy, you know, they, invariably within a year, they'd be declaring emergency for no HUD. Yeah. So, <laughs> so you just okay, that- you just described me, where I showed up in, <laughs> in uh, VF thirty one as a friend. I'm like, you HUD cripples, learn to fly yeah. the airplane, and then I start flying it at the boat. I'm like. Oh my God! I get it. I don't have a HUD. I am a I am a hazard to anything in the air right now because I don't have a HUD. I get me on the ground right now. Okay, there's an analogy to that. When the uh, first Hornets came through Top Gun in the mid 1980s, you had a bunch of most of the Top Gun staff was F-14A pilots and Rios, right. and no INS, no big deal. But the Hornet needed the INS for all kinds of things, and so they would call up. You know, when they're rolling for a flight, they'd go. Uh, I don't have an INS. We're down, you know, and and the Tomcat guys and the staff are going, what? What's this all about? You know, stay with the plane. No INS. It was fascinating, it was fascinating so, stuff. Similar. Yeah. Yeah. Coach, you know, I'd, I'd forgotten what you described there. You could. One, one of the things that that people who have not flown behind the boat may not realize is that there's a real art when you're when you're coming around the corner, whether you're on a shit hot break or not. You come around the corner, you're getting ready to roll wings level. Most guys will, you know, power might still be at idle if you're on a shit hot break, but most guys will anticipate and have the throttles way back because you're you're carrying too much speed because you're at an angle of bank. And as soon as you roll wings level, you've got way too much power, and the the note the tail would come up, and in the F-14, it's so big, that's a real big movement, you know, and it's real obvious from the ship. And you don't want to have any hard comments from paddles, you know. And so you'd come around the corner and you'd anticipate that rollout by pulling a little power off. And then you're hunting for that. You've, you've got to anticipate the power back on again, or you'll end up real slow and you'll show the whole tennis court to the paddles and again, get a hard comment. And so that power carrot was perfect. And you could just, when you roll wings level, you could just bring the, the power carrot and the E together right across from the, the, uh, the velocity vector and make a perfect line. And you were neither accelerating nor decelerating, and the crotch is right on the ship, and you were coming down a three degree glide slope. And it it was really, really straightforward. You know, I mean, it really was. It was so cool. There's so many t- cool tools. It was uh, it was such an easy, intuitive display. Um, I'm sh- now the LSO in me is saying, hey, we may have been spotting the deck a little bit, which is which is a big problem. But uh, but I tell you what, we were. We were good. And, uh, you know, um, Eric Hildebrand has that series of books, right? Um, and he was out on that last deployment where we had, and I was in 213, and he has a photo of our greenie board. And I told him, like, man, you, you, grabbed the pinnacle of my career it's like all it's all okays and there might there might have been a no grade in there but um <laughs> i'm not sure what happened on that one but i was like man eric you got the pinnacle of my career because i was flying at 14 d's and i was just like man i know you know you got 2500 hours in an airplane and you just you're you get you know everything about it and there was just so many so many great tools oh bio's got it handy he's got the book handy he's looking Okay, if I don't find it real quick, I'll just take a picture and and send it to him. Funny how it starts to blur, and then yeah, I, I don't remember. I was in, I was flying Tomcats, and I was pretty good. <laughs> right, right, right. You're okay, commander I somewhere. In there. I can't find it, but uh, but what I'll do is I'll hold up the book, and then uh, we'll 
I'll send the picture to Scott when I find it later. Yeah, it was it was pretty stinking good. I remember it. Yeah, there's the book right there. That's Eric's book. And, uh, there's the book. Favorite book. Yeah. As a matter of fact, of course, it's my own, but what good? What's that? Yeah. 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 What's that? It's one of my favorite books. No. Oh yeah. Of course. Not as good as yours, Milo, but pretty good. Jungle, thanks. I need to send you a check now. You got it. Awesome. Hey, you know, we could sit here and chat all day, but uh, we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up soon. So Jungle, start thinking about is there anything that uh, that we didn't ask you yet? But bef- while you're thinking about that in one part of your brain, with the other part of your brain, where did jungle come from? If you can tell us. So um, yeah, jungle. Um uh, back in the, gosh, was that the 70s, I guess? There was an animated TV series, you know, cartoon, um, George of the Jungle. Uh, I remember that. Old. Yep. Yeah, so uh, George, it was a spoof on Tarzan, and he was uh, always swinging on vines into trees. And his song, the theme song, uh, was George, George, George of the Jungle, friend to you and me, George, George, George of the Jungle, watch out for that tree. I may or may not have managed to hit some trees at two different parties, two different times, two different crowds. Um, once was my boat party in Texas, uh, Bevo, you know, 4 a.m., you know, and a buddy of mine had a new Jeep and he's unconscious drunk in the living room, you know, and I'm like, dude, I want to drive your Jeep. Give me your keys. It's like, and my call sign there was Indy. He's like, Indy, you can't drive. You're drunk. I'm like, I'm not going to drive it on the road. And that made total sense to him. <laughs> and uh and so we we hopped in and i'm out in the backyard doing donuts and they they say there's a, a beer and a and a pretty girl behind every tree in south texas the only problem is there's no trees and um, <laughs> <laughs> and it turns out there was that one <laughs> in the middle of that backyard I'm, I'm putting a ton of dust in the air and and i just see this tree go by in the headlights and i was like was that it and i look over at my buddy you know we had the top and the doors off I look over at my buddy and say, was that a tree? And just in time to see him go flying out into the dust. And I'd, I'd slid sideways into that, that tree. And everybody on the patio started singing, George, George, George. George. <laughs> well, that's a good one. Yeah. And then, and it didn't stick. I was still in the, until I was on vacation in Maui. And I had a Pontiac Sunbird convertible with one of my best friends and our, our dates. And uh, I was going to a spot on the southwest side of Maui where all the all the resorts are now, but back then it was just empty beach and no real trails or a couple of Jeep trails, but they were sand. And I'm in a sunny next sunbird and you just got to keep your knots up, you know, or you're going to get stuck in the sand. And I'm, I'm driving out to the beach and, and there's these two palm trees at the top of the, the, the sand dune. And my buddy is like, it's not going to make it. I'm like, it's going to make it. It's not going to make it. It's going to make it. And it made it. went right through, but it left the side view mirrors and the trim on both sides in the sand. Oh no! Um, so he was he was present for both of those events. Oh, that's and awesome. made sure that, that jungle stuck after that. Jungle, this has been an amazing, amazing conversation. I can't wait to uh, see you down in Jacks. Hey, just tell everybody, plug your uh, plug your marina. Where you at? Yeah, so uh, so I'm in uh, south of Jacks, down the uh, St. Johns River, um, south of uh, NAS Jacks. Uh, on Doctor's Lake, and I own uh, Doctor's Lake Marina. I put a little bar in uh, called the Sunset Tiki Bar. It's won a bunch of awards, including the best place in Jacksonville to watch the sunset. And uh, it's just it's just a tiny little place. It looks a whole lot bigger on social media than it is. But uh, uh, we're open um, uh, every night during you know nine months out of the year. During the winter, we're down to just the weekends. Uh, but uh, but right now is is uh chamber of commerce kind of weather down here so uh fire pits and live music and uh food trucks on the weekends and, and uh, we just have a blast you know it's uh and we have fire squadrons come in and do um uh do call sign derbies and uh, we have a great time there oh that sounds awesome that sounds so good all right well so for all the listeners if you're ever down there at doctor's lake in south of jacksonville swim by jungles place enjoy the sunset yeah. i'm gonna do that yeah. and i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna pick up a trip come down like we talked about before we started hitting record i'm definitely gonna I can't wait it. it's, it's been great catching back up with you and i look forward to seeing you in person yes sir yeah absolutely me as well all right well thank you sir i appreciate it this has been incredible and uh our next episode after this we're gonna get uh fun malay on and we're gonna talk about all the stuff in the back seat to include j tits and all that other stuff so um we're gonna have that one but uh, you know 
who knows, maybe we could get the two of you guys on here to talk about F-14D stuff at some point in the future. That'd be a lot of fun. Yeah, fun's the man. There's yeah. almost nobody better to talk about the backseat than him. It's yeah. fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. All right. And one of these days, I'm going to roll up to Jacksonville and uh, and and uh, drop in and have a beer with you, Jungle. Please do. Please do. Thanks. We, you just missed the pitch. Crunch was kind enough to, to, uh, to no. let me play the marina and Sunset Tiki Bar. I heard it. I like that. <laughs> well, I'm going. All right, man. Well, thanks, Jungle. I appreciate it. This has been uh, this has been an amazing interview. And thanks to all the listeners for listening to the F-14 Tomcast as we talk about the F-14D Super Tomcat. Thanks, gentlemen. In the history of tactical aviation, some of the most demanding and exciting missions have been the tactical reconnaissance missions. So be sure to join us for our next episode where we talk about the Tomcat's reconnaissance capability using the TARPS pod. The episode is loaded with technical and operational details, so don't miss it.